Hello, Flori. Nandiyan ka na pala. Ikaw pala si M.A. A blessed morning to everyone. Today is a special day for us as Scholarians for we celebrate another year of fruitful learning. Welcome to the 45th Foundation Day of Centro Escolar Las Piñas with the theme, Escolarians Committed to Embrace Positive Changes in Times of Challenges. My name is Ms. Rosel and I am your host for today. Let us start this event with the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. You may now be seated. This year has truly been challenging to all of us due to the pandemic that we are currently facing. But with God's grace, we are able to gather together to virtually celebrate and commemorate the school's 45th Foundation Day. To give us a glimpse of what we are about to witness in this day's event, here is an empowering woman that we, as Scholarians, look up to. To give her welcome remarks, may I present Dr. Maria Cristina Di Padolina, the president of Centro Escolar Las Piñas. Let's give her a warm round of applause. A warm good, good morning to everyone. 
Good morning, Dr. Padalina. Congratulations and best wishes to the CELP community, the officials, faculty and staff, students and parents and alumni. The celebration of anniversaries is important because it is an occasion for communities to come together. During these times of community quarantine, we may be separated physically, but this virtual celebration shows that we are together in spirit. We come together to celebrate the founding of our school 45 years ago. CELP, starting as Las Piñas College, has significantly contributed not just to the personal development and professional success of its graduates, but also to community development. We especially greet our students and their parents for their decision to continue with their studies, even with the difficulties posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our bodies continue to grow physically, and it is, it is important, especially for the young, to continue to stimulate their brain by continuing to learn. We must continue to engender the habit of learning among our students. We also thank our teachers. Your presence, even virtually, is essential this time. You have done very much to organize and facilitate the learning of our students. We usually refer to the role of learners in loco parentis, meaning in place of parents. We have a new term at this time as we refer to the new role of parents in loco magister, in place of teachers. We appreciate the learning guidance that parents are doing for their children at this time. Keeping a school running with personnel working not together on site, but apart in many different locations is not easy. We congratulate our school administrators and their staff, Dr. Nila Abelia, Ms. Rose Bustamante, Ms. Celia Lamarca, Dr. Eric Halcon for maintaining school operations and doing it very well. Thank you for the organizers of this celebration. Thank you, Dr. Perez, Teresa Perez, for joining us, Dr. Flori Anastasio and Dr. Eric Halcon for sharing us with us and with all our participants in social media, the words of wisdom. To our technical crew and support staff who enabled this virtual gathering, we are also very thankful. We thank the Lord for his continuing guidance and grace. His love is the pillar of our strength and the source of our inspiration. The best way to celebrate the founding of our school is to continue with even greater vigor, the service of education and the service to the community. Mabuhay ang CELP. Maganda umaga sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much for that inspiring message, Dr. Padolina. Sure, you have just set the mood of our viewers. For almost four months, Escolarians are exploring and facing the challenges that online learning brings. That poses a question of, how do we cope with the major change that this pandemic has caused? Well, that is what our first webinar will be all about. So without much further ado, let me call on Dr. Rosemary Vic Bustamante, Assistant to the Vice President, to introduce our first webinar speaker. Hello and good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Maria Flordeliza L. Anastasio, our special guest this morning. Dr. Maria Flordeliza L. Anastasio is the Vice President and Dean of Studies of Centro Escolar University, Malolos. After her long stint as Dean of the School of Accountancy and Management 
of Central Escolar University, Manila. She was the former national president of the Philippine Society for Educational Research and Evaluation and the Philippine Council of Deans and Educators of Business. At present, she is the president of the International Academy of Accountants for Business, Research and Education. She earned her master's degree, doctoral degree, and postdoctoral degree in total quality management in Central Scholar University, Manila. She is an active accreditor, evaluator, and assessor of the Commission of Higher Education and Quality Assurance and Assessor of the and an expert consultant of the Department of Education K-12 programs. Dr. Anastasio was one of the first four scholars to take the Daad Dice International Dean's course in Germany. And now she is one of the three regional experts, mentors of the Daad IDC Southeast Asia. And today, she will be sharing with us her expert opinion on the topic, Embracing Change the Scholarian Way. With that, I ask that you give full attention to our speaker and help me in welcoming Dr. Maria Flordeliza L. Anastasio. Thank you so much, Dr. Bustamante. Dr. Anastasio, it's now your turn. Um, Dr. Anastasio, uh, please unmute po your MS Teams. Good morning, okay. everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. Good morning to our dear CELP family. We congratulate you today on your 45th Foundation Day. And from CEU Malolos, we are one with you in this great celebration. Happy 45th anniversary. Happy Sapphire anniversary. Indeed, Sapphire is a symbol of the heavens. It is a symbol of innocence, a promoter of good health. It also brings joy, prosperity, peace, beauty, and love, which are all the things that we aspire for this pandemic time. Sapphire is also the stone of royalty and therefore, I would say that at this time, CELP joins the list of universities, schools, and colleges that are now at par with royalty. So, congratulations, Dr. Padalina, and to our dear Dr. Abelia and her team as you celebrate this very, very special day. My very important topic today is focused on embracing change the Escolarian way or the ECEW. How do you feel now, my dear friends, after 222 days in quarantine and lockdown? This is our 222nd day in lockdown. What did CELP do to cope during these days? How did we address the fears of COVID-19? Would you like to undergo rapid testing and other tests that may be applicable for this tests of COVID? Indeed, my dear friends, no one was prepared for this pandemic 
time. COVID-19 is characterized by UFC. U for uncertain, F for fluid, fragility, fear, and challenges. Indeed, these are difficult times. These are challenging times. For us in academe, may I... May, may I request the monitor, uh, the one to manage my screen? Please connect my slides now, please. I cannot control it here, from here. Okay, so COVID-19 situation is really described in one word. We call it fear. We fear everything and we run. There are a lot of victims, especially now in higher education and in schools in general. The first victim is quality assurance in education. Indeed, COVID-19 has a lot of impact on the way we run schools, thus affecting the quality of education, the quality of remote teaching, the quality of learning, the quality of our services, the quality of our certificate uh, search and uh, move for certification and accreditation. It has also some impact on academic freedom, on our institutional autonomy, and it has brought us to higher levels of risks. What are these risks that we are facing now, my dear friends? One is characterized as internal risks and the other as external risks. Under internal risk, we are facing strategic operations and market risk. Under strategic risk, we fear and we are all afraid what will happen to investments, what will happen to research and development, and for us, what will happen to teaching. Second, under operations risks, administrators are facing some possibilities of lack of qualified academic staff to handle all this remote teaching and learning, impacts on wages, liquidity, technology, and IT. For marketing risk, we do face a lot of risk on recruitment and enrollment. We face some risks in media, social media. Under external risk, which is the second group of risk that we are facing, we face political risks like new policies that may be passed by government, lack of political support perhaps, and lack of financial support because of some budget constraints. And the last group will be legal risks, like what are these things that we are facing now? A new set of policies from CHAD, from DOLE, from the Department of Health and other government institutions. The seventh impact to quality assurance is economic, and budgetary implementation in higher education and in schools and colleges. Of course, we have to balance between economic and health issues. Where do our funds go? Will it go to economic development and uh, recovery, or will we push it so that it will go to health, which is our main uh, problem today? Our COVID-19 times also lead us to some changes or a lot of changes. And uh, this brings us to change in the labor market. 
in the shift in skills needed by industry and it impacts on our life and work balance. My dear friends, these are the impacts of uh, COVID-19 to the way we run schools today in terms of quality of education. The second victim of the pandemic in education is research. What happened to our research during this pandemic time? Some research or many research activities were indeed disrupted. We encountered obstacles in research collaboration. There were closures of laboratories. We have a lot of delayed research projects. There were interruptions in our cooperation and strategic alliances, and we see a shortfall in research spending. There are also prospects of decreased public and private spending in terms of aid for researchers. We also see some problems and risks for graduating students, especially for those doing research because they cannot go out to gather data. Next is the shift to remote collaboration. But one problem here really would be connectivity as well as linkage with other universities. And the last would be an increased need for a costly part of the university, which we call putting up virtual laboratories. These are the many impact of pandemic to research. The third victim of pandemic in education is internationalization and mobility. Indeed, we see that there is a decrease in the number of students, foreign students coming to our country, as well as staff mobility. In papers that I read, they say that two thirds of institutions saw a decrease in student and staff mobility this time. We see a lot of travel restrictions, so we cannot or we find it difficult to benchmark and collaborate with other universities. We see expiring grants, so we cannot continue with our projects. We see expiring visa and resident permits of our foreign students. We see a big challenge for both the hosting and sending schools in terms of scholarships. There is also an impending um, reality that the cost of travel will really, really increase tremendously. This decrease in mobility has somehow on also led to a high demand of psychological counseling or what we call now a psycho psychological first aid. We also see that there is a need now for more financial support to institutions so that they can continue with their internationalization programs and the need to collaborate so that we can perhaps maximize this collaboration and linkage to have and to acquire virtual laboratories, virtual classrooms, and virtual mobilities. CLP in COVID time really needs to respond to these challenges, particularly quality assurance, research, internationalization of education. But as we are moving together far from each other, we have to focus on instruction. And this brings us to our first answer and response, perhaps together. Uh, as an umbrella under CEU, we should embrace the flexible learning system. And there are two Ds that are part or elements of embracing flexible learning. First is the delivery, and the second is the design. Under delivery, indeed, we need a lot of investments on digital technology and other non-digital 
technology perhaps that will improve the mode of delivery of instruction. It is just uh, very good that we were able to anticipate some of this two or three years ago. That's why we have the canvas and this is really helping us a lot. For some institutions, it is really advisable that we do not focus much on putting up or building infrastructure projects, but focus our budgets more on IT infrastructure. We have also to have us to strike a good balance between online and offline and synchronous as well as asynchronous delivery of our lessons. The second element to have a very good flexible learning system is a design. We really need to train our teachers to come up with very, very, very important modules that are responsive to the needs of the times. And one challenge here really is how we could manage with connectivity, bandwidth and gadgets. The second thing that CLP can do is really to improve on the faculty digital education. Particularly, we have to focus on training on remote teaching and online facilitation. Remote teaching and learning requires really a shift in the mindset of our teachers and our learners, but there are some issues when it comes to remote teaching and learning, like issues on how our teachers are coping up because our students are really digital natives, while our teachers are not, or many of our teachers are not yet digital natives. So we really need to have a very, very strong training program on IT for teachers. We really need to shift from a teacher-centered approach to a more stu student or learner-centered approach, that is from pedagogy to andragogy. Some of these challenges now that we have in remote learning is the need for us to focus on some scenarios that our students will appreciate better, like experiential learning, solving problems, high level of or higher level of student engagement. Perhaps we can adopt peer consulting, peer mentoring. We can apply and introduce the case approach as well as, well as doing things collaboratively and in teamwork so that this will also promote the team spirit in spite of our distance from each other. The second thing under faculty digital education is really to promote monthly regular workshops for teachers. At least we should meet regularly to get feedback. There should be quarterly showcase where we can share best practices among faculty. We can also join teaching and learning alliances and consortia where we learn from each other and it's also good for us if we can train our teachers to make their own videos and instructional materials. So those are the things that we can do under faculty digital education. The third thing that uh, CLP may do is to advance education through feedback on the design of online teaching by faculty experts. I know that your modules are validated by faculty experts and this is very good. Okay. Second is to get feedback from our students themselves, feedback on the instructional design as well as feedback on the mode of our delivery and we can do this more often so that we can improve and uh, manage our learning, teaching and learning processes better. And third is to justify the class size, meaning we can take a look at how we can manage the class, big class, small class, as long as the teacher has a very good module and knows how to deliver it through online facilitation, then that could be good. That could be a good class size. Number four is to understand our external trends. They say that 50% of the jobs 
today will require new skills for me it's not just 50 percent perhaps even 75 percent of the jobs will really require new skills and uh, what are these new skills that we have to respond to we call this as the ICT skills ICT for me stands for I we need really IT skills and independent learning skills our students now do not go to school so they learn independently they have really to learn to work independently so that's for the I. The C stands for three things. Communication skills, competence and character, as well as critical thinking skills. And the T will refer to thinking skills, which also includes critical thinking, problem solving and creativity and teamwork. These are the skills the new skills that we all need today whether you are a student or a teacher or an administrator we really need this these are the characteristics needed in the new and in the next reality how do we define now the role of celp in the next reality will this happen very soon perhaps not until as dr padelina always say until we have the vaccine things will not will be different okay and we redefine the role of clp in the next reality through a word that i i coined i call it rika we all have to be resilient we all have to be innovative we all have to be creative and we all have to be adaptable and agile to prepare for the next reality and to manage the new normal where we are in today. What can CELP do in the post-COVID-19 world? First, as I mentioned, let us all be sensitive towards alternative learning mode. This, I believe this will stay, the alternative learning mode will stay. Second is always come together to talk about the situation at this present time. Scenario planning and analysis is really very important for administrators and for faculty. So we have a very changing world today, a changing world. The scenario last week is different from this week. So we have to meet regularly to talk about what is the present scenario and respond to this. The third is for the organization to be agile, to respond to the pressing issues, to respond to the risks that I mentioned earlier, strategic operations, market, political, and legal risks. Third, fourth is for us to develop propensity and uh, use in the use of technology. Fifth is always to consider the demand and the concerns and the requirements of our stakeholders so that we can also engage them in the learning and teaching process today. And of course, as we always say in CEU, the pandemic should not stop us, but it should keep us moving. We have to continue education. We have to continue our engagement in the university or in CELP. There are several strategic responses also that we can do as uh, young people, as adults. One is to keep calm. Do not be agitated immediately, but we have to follow strictly the rules like physical distancing in school and in the campus and wherever we are and the use of all the PPEs, etc. We can adopt systems thinking in the way we run the school, especially now that we are far from each other, we really have to have our systems and processes in place. Number three is also to consider still strategic partnership. In spite of distance, we have to be in sync with, the, uh, with our partners, with our linkages, with our strategic alliances. Number four, is to make sure that we come up or identify 
new target groups. Like in our enrollment, some schools have decreased in their enrollment. Let us try to identify new target groups, perhaps, and perhaps new courses that we can offer that will respond to the demands of the new normal. Fifth, as we mentioned, is to embrace again the modes of delivery of instruction, online learning, flexible learning, blended learning, perhaps distance learning. Okay. Number six is to integrate entrepreneurship in the curriculum. We all know that today the flourishing business are those who know or who know something about entrepreneurship. So uh, what are these things that we have to include in the curriculum? Perhaps the grades 11 and 12 should emphasize more on the different skills for young entrepreneurs. We can also teach our staff, faculty on how to be entrepreneurial persons. Number seven is to set priority for research and uh, bring our research to its commercialization level. This is what we call as entrepreneurial attitude in research. We do have a lot of good researches, but sometimes it ends up in our lockers and in our library. Number eight is to focus on communication, not just information. So we have to learn to communicate together, not just to send out messages and information. Number nine is to adopt the collaborative leadership model. At this time, we do not see each other. The administrative council, your uh, leaders in the school do not see each other, but the university is moving. It is rising because of collaborative leadership. Okay, and the 10th is still we have to internationalize. Sometimes Dr. Perez would say, oh, it's easier to internationalize now because we do not spend much for travel. Okay, so we can just use our, what we call as table conferences, table benchmarking. We can uh, reach out to our colleagues abroad uh, digitally. Okay, so these are my friends these are some of the strategic responses that we can have this pandemic time it may not be easy but we can we can do it in times of change therefore we really have to learn to to have a different mindset we need a different skill set a different tool set and a quality mindset for me, I was able to read a book which says, be a dog, be a dragon, be a diplomat, and I adopted it here for my talk today. First, in times of change, be a dog. A dog symbolizes peace, love, new beginnings. This is what CELP stands today on your 45th anniversary. As I mentioned in my talk, Sapphire, represents peace, love, and this is what you are supposed to be on your 45th anniversary. A dove symbolizing peace, symbolizing love, symbolizing new beginnings. For us in CEU, that is character, the character of the Escalarian who brings peace and love and new beginnings everywhere. The second D is to be a dragon. A dragon may be, uh, you may be afraid of the picture of a dragon, but the dragon, my friend, symbolizes wisdom, courage, strength. For us in CEU, this is a very, very important character of an Escalarian, to be a person of wisdom, to be a person of courage and strength. In this pandemic time, though we are afraid of many things, let us be courageous. Let us use our gift of wisdom and discernment because this is what we are called to be, to be people of competence, to be people of science. Okay, and the third D in times of change is to be a diplomat. A diplomat is an advocate of harmony, an advocate of cooperation, meaning we should be an agent 
a catalyst of change. My dear friends, let us be a dove, a dragon, a diplomat. Today, we see and we hear a lot of buzzwords in education that calls to be for us to be in the new normal. One, flexible learning, pandemic, work from home, work on a campus, work from anywhere, etc. So all of these things are really buzzwords that we have to embrace at this moment to be in sync with this call for the new normal. My dear students, friends, faculty, do we think or do you think we can still go back to the good old days? Will things be the same like before? My friends, things may never go back to the normal very soon or it may never go. We may never be there again. We just need to accept the fact that things will never be the same again after COVID-19. We need to create a new normal. Let us help build a new and a better normal, as Dr. Padulina always say. Let us cast out our fear and be the courageous and strong Escolarian. Let us cast out our fear. Fear should not be fear everything and run, but we should change it to face everything and rise. As you celebrate your 45th anniversary, my dear CELP family, let us face everything and rise. COVID-19 and in the next will really be, will really change our life from an uncertain, fluid, fragile, fearful, and challenging time like we have now we have to change and create our new reality where we are resilient, innovative, creative, adaptable, and agile. And in the next reality and in the next normal, let us embrace change the Escolarian way. Congratulations on your 45th anniversary. Happy Sapphire anniversary, everyone. Please be a dove, a dragon, and a diplomat, my dear CELP family. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Flor Deliza L. Anastasio for that informative talk. May we request you to stay for a while. At this moment, we would like to award you a certificate of appreciation for sharing your time and expertise with us. To present the certificate, May I call on Dr. Leonila C. Abelia, Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Rizal. Centro Escolar Las Piñas presents this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Maria Flor Delisa L. Anastasio for having delivered the talk entitled Embracing Change the Escolarian Way, ECEW, during the 45th Foundation Day of CLP with the theme, Escolarians Committed to Embrace Positive Changes in Times of Challenges. Given this 19th day of October, 2020, signed a year's truly, as AVP for Academic Affairs, and Dr. Teresa R. Perez, as the Vice President for Academic Affairs, and our President, Dr. Maria Cristina D. Padulina. Congratulations and thank you so much, Dr. Anastasio, for your talk. Good morning. Thank you too, and congratulations, Dr. Abelia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Abelia, and of course, Dr. Anastasio. We will now proceed to the next webinar, which involves the importance of communication to both students and professionals. Here is Mr. Vladimir C. Ocampo, 
college instructor to introduce our next speaker. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good, good morning. morning, sir. Good morning to our Good morning to all our officials, students, faculty, and parents. Now, our next speaker may be a man of few words, but he is definitely a man full of actions. Needless to say, he is a perfect specimen of intelligence and good looks. It is funny that some would claim that he is the lookalike of a famous actor, Alden Richards. And because he is a good friend of mine, I choose not to disagree. He is not only knowledgeable in his field, but also handsome. He is a striking example of the saying, hindi lahat ng guapo nag artista Yung iba, nagtuturo sa academe. Our, our speaker has been with the academe for 20 school years already. He earned his Doctor of Philosophy in Business from De La Salle University in 2010. He is currently the program head of non-science programs of Centro Escolar Las Piñas, and a special guest lecturer at Chiang Kai-shek College in Manila. A published author, he will be releasing his textbook on health economics in November. He has previously taught at Far Eastern University Manila, Assumption College, and St. Scholastica's College. He was also the former dean of the School of Business I Academy and a lecturer of Business Administration at Trappel's College of Higher Education in Singapore. He has presented his research paper in various international conferences held in the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. His fields of specialization include economics, social responsibility, operation research, and business education. Lastly, he is one of the wonderful people I always look up to as my beloved mentors. The other two amazing people are Dr. Leonina Abelia and Dr. Charito Bermido. So with much excitement and anticipation, may I respectfully call on our speaker, Dr. Frederick Halcon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very much honored to be invited to give a talk on communication essentials. Uh, this is one of the most practical uh, and most useful teaching modules that uh, you will ever hear and ever encounter because wherever you go, you will always deal with effective communication skills and it's one of the necessary skills that you should build on most especially if you want to become competitive in this uh, time and age so uh, without further ado i would begin my talk so you might be wondering what is communication it is simply the process by which people attempt to share meaning via the transmission of symbolic messages so we communicate through words through sounds, right? Through written letters, etc. So, uh, what does communication involve? Okay, so for you to be able to communicate effectively, you need the following uh, elements in communication. You need people, that's one, right? So people need to understand how, how they relate to each other, right? Okay, so you also have the shared meaning. Uh, to communicate, people must agree on the different terms that they are using, right? So there are words that may have different meanings to everyone, right? But uh, the common idea of having a language is that uh, you agree on a common meaning for a particular word, right? Okay, so for example, in the Philippines, we use the word mahal. Okay, mahal could mean different things, right? So mahal could mean expensive. It could also mean love, right? Love as a ver verb, right? Uh, well, when you go to other neighboring countries in Asia, the word mahal also exists, right? So just like when you go to uh, Malaysia or Indonesia or Singapore or even Brunei, when you say mahal, it means expensive, 
right? Okay. And then our word for love is uh, also sinta. Sinta, right? But in our neighboring Asian countries, it's chinta. So it sounds the same, but basically it means love, right? So uh, what do you call this? Communication. Okay, we communicate through words, but the way we say it could also mean different things to other people, right? So uh, for communication, we deal with people. You have shared meaning, right? And symbols. You might be surprised how rich our, our language is and how common some of our words are to our neighboring countries, right? Uh, for example, lima, lima, which means five in Filipino, also means the same in Malaysia and Indonesia. So when you say lima over there, it also basically means five. And when you say mata, which means I, right? I, the I, right? It also means I over there, right? Payong also means payong over there, right? So you will be amazed how much we have in common with our neighboring countries, right? Okay, so we have people, shared meaning, and symbols, right? If you, if you are wondering how do babies communicate, right? They communicate through sounds, right? Once the baby starts crying, then maybe the diaper is wet or he or she is hungry, right? So what do you call this? Uh, we communicate through words, but for an infant, they may not understand words yet, but they communicate through sounds, right? Okay, so symbols, yes, gestures, sounds, letters, numbers, and words can only appro approximate or represent the ideas they are meant to communicate, right? So that's what communication involves, okay? What else? So uh, if you are students of an English class, in the next slide, you will see the a model of the communication process. So you have the sender, right? The, uh, you basically, you choose your words in your brain, in your head, so you're technically encoding the message, okay? Then you select a channel, okay, to communicate your message. It could be through email, through chat, through messenger, through WhatsApp, through Viber, right? Uh, through your social media accounts. So you know what? Nowadays, communication has evolved from traditional letter writing, right, to more modern means of communicating, okay? So, um, the channel is the way through which you communicate, right? Okay, and then you have the receiver. The receiver is being decoded, or I mean, the message is being decoded by the receiver, right? Okay, so the receiver will then give you a feedback. Did he or she understand what you're trying to say, right? So if yes, then maybe you have understood each other. If not, then maybe there is the presence of what you call a noise. So a noise is anything that distorts the message, right? For example, in, in our language, okay, uh, we all know that we were all uh, colonized by the Spaniards for so long, 300 years maybe, if I remember my Philippine history, right? But uh, if you say the word leche, <laughs> leche could mean different things, right? But leche is a Spanish word that basically means milk, right? But if you use it in the Philippines, it could be misconstrued as something else. It's it could mean that you are cursing someone or you're saying a cuss word, you're expressing uh, agitation, frustration, or madness, or <laughs> anger, right? So it could mean different words, but a very uh, different meaning rather. But you know, uh, leche essentially means milk, which is technically a very harmless word, right? Okay, same thing in the Philippines. When you say muchacho or muchacha, it means a very derogatory term. You don't say that just to say it, right? Okay, but in Spanish, muchacho and muchacha basically means boy or girl. It's no different from niño y niña, right? So, you know, uh, what do you call this? Maybe the words have evolved through time because of culture, because of practice, because of views, because of shared meaning. I'll give you another harmless word, right? 
the word um what do you call this there are there are a lot of words in the english language that uh what do you call this the way we interpret it's different for example the word salvage right okay <laughs> The, when you hear the word salvage or when you mention the word salvage to a uh, Filipino, it may mean the aftermath of something violent. But when you say salvage, technically, the real meaning of salvage is basically means to save, right? So salvage actually means a good word. It's actually a good meaning. It has a good meaning, but it's just that the way we interpret it Maybe culturally, when you say the word salvage, it means a different thing already. Okay, so basically you have here a model of the communication process. And maybe that's why we misunderstand each other. It's because of some noise, right? It could be cultural, it could be physical noise, it could be something else, right? So uh, let's proceed. So basically here, this is another model or a representation of the communication process. Okay, if you are an English student, I'm pretty sure you have taken this already, so no need for me to elaborate on this. Okay, so the elements of the communication are as follows. You have the sender, the receiver, the message, encoding, and decoding. Uh, at this point, maybe it's more helpful if we will try to relate it to the way we use our social media. Okay, so maybe why is it that people attack you in social media, you suddenly became uh, viral in a not so good way. Maybe it's because they did not understand you, right? Okay, or the way they interpreted your, your message or post is very much different from the way you intended it to be, right? So maybe, okay, uh, there is some form of noise that happened in the communication process. Right, so the moral lesson is this, think before you click, right? Think before you click, okay. So, for example, the way Facebook has evolved with its uh, reactions, right? Reaction icons, before it was just the like, right? Okay, uh, sometimes you, you will wonder, you posted something that is, uh, you're trying to share with your friends something that is, uh, you're having a, a bad day, right, or someone in your family got sick, and then people started liking it, right? Uh, it, fe it feels a little weird. So you like someone in my family getting sick? <laughs> so that's why maybe Facebook has evolved its different uh, reaction icons already. Because, you know, sometimes uh, your intention is to uh, pat your friend on the back, right? at least virtually. Oh, you're doing okay even if you're having a bad day, right? But actually, because you have liked that sad post of your friend, okay, <laughs> it killed the relationship, it killed the friendship, right? So that's why you be, you. Uh, it's very important that you think before you post, you try to uh, put yourself in the shoes of the one uh, receiving the message, right? Because it might come across something that is wrong or different. Okay, so uh, that's why one of my favorite lessons in my management class would be this particular lesson, which is communication. Most especially if you're going to be professionals in the future, you're going to be college students or high school students. This one is very, very, very practical. Okay, so you go, you're going to use it even if you're already in your 30s, 40s, 50s, professionals, okay? You need to uh, be brushed up with your communication. You also have the channel, of course, the feedback, and the noise. Why is it that you're not understood? It's because of the noise. Noise here does not necessarily mean the, the physical noise or the auditory noise. Anything that diminishes the meaning of what you're trying to say that is considered noise, right? The, the inability of your friend to understand English, the inability of your friend to understand Filipino, the, in the inability of your friend to understand or your parents to understand uh, millennial speak, that is also a form of noise, right? Okay, so let's try to move 
Uh, forward. Okay, so there are two channels of communication. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. So you have formal and informal, right? Okay. Uh, students, if you have a memo from your class advisor, that is an example of a formal communication, right? If your teacher sends you an official letter from the school, that is a formal communication, right? If you are an employee, if you receive a letter of appointment from your boss, that's an official form of communication. It's a formal one, right? But if uh, communication exists outside uh, some form of authority, then it is informal, right? Maybe your Facebook uh, page or Twitter page or your uh your instagram that's some form of an informal communication which you want to share want to share with the world right so that is a form of an informal communication but um the ones that come from the office from the school from the government those are examples of formal channels of communication right okay so let's try to move forward okay so what are the formal channels of communication? You have newsletters, memos, reports, minutes of the meeting. Okay, so you will encounter this if you are already a professional. Okay, if you are already a professional, this is nothing new to you, right? So these are formal channels of communication. Now let's try to go to the direction of communication. Okay, sometimes you have a concern, you want to voice it out, so you pass through uh, formal channels of communication, okay? Suppose you're a staff, you have uh, some issues, okay? So you course it through your boss, that is some form of a vertical communication. Sometimes your boss has uh, an announcement to the rest of the group, that is also form of vertical communication, okay? And sometimes you have to talk to, with each other in the organization, okay? Uh, a staff to staff meeting, right? Okay, so that is what you call lateral communication. Sometimes the vice presidents of the organization uh, coordinate with each other. That's also a form of uh, lateral communication. So if the communication direction is sideways, same level of hierarchy, same position in the comp company, that's lateral. But if there is some regard to authority, that is vertical. Okay. So you will encounter this once you become professionals in schools or in a classroom setting. Okay, you have the class officers. Okay, they have an announcement coming from your class advisor. That is some form of vertical communication, right? Okay, so let's try to move forward. Okay, so we discussed this already. You have the vertical and the lateral. Okay, so you also have what you call downward or upward communication, right? So... Communication that flows from one level of a group or organization to a lower level is downward communication, okay? Uh, for example, the boss announces something, right? Everyone will get a raise, oh, hopefully, in this time of a pandemic, right? So that's form of downward communication. But there are some uh, instances where in, uh, the staff would have to communicate very important matters, okay, to management. That is some form of upward communication, okay? For example, you will see in some companies, they take to the streets, they host strikes or they conduct strikes, right? Okay, so that is a, a form of what you call upward communication, right? Because they are trying to voice out their concerns, right? Okay, so for example, here are specific ones of downward communication, assigning goals, providing job instructions, informing employees of policies and procedures, pointing out problems that need attention and offering feedback about performance. So if you're already an employee, you will get your annual appraisal, right? Your annual performance review, right? So that is an example of downward communication. Okay, so moving forward, we also have upward communication. So for example, providing feedback to higher ups, you also evaluate your boss, right? You inform managers of progress towards goals, relaying current problems to managers, keeping managers aware of how employees feel about their jobs, co-workers, and the organization. This is an example of upward communication. Okay, if you are a student, maybe 
you uh, give suggestions to how how to improve the club, the student organization, uh, maybe the campus facilities. Okay, so you course that through your student council. You course that through your advisor. That is a form of upward communication. Okay, so you also have performance reports, sub suggestion boxes, right? So how can we help you better? How can we improve our performance? That's an example of upward communication. Employee attitude surveys, grievance procedures, okay. Superior subordinate discussions, informal gripe sessions, okay. So this is also a form of upward communication, okay. So for example, okay, this is uh, the engineering department of a company. Next slide, please, okay. So you have lateral communication, the chain of command, and you have the different contacts outside the company. So this is a particular map of possible communication channels, right? That may happen, okay? So for example, you have here a department in the company, let's say it's the engineering department, okay? Uh, the engineering department is the one creating the machine, setting up the machines for production. So they give feedback to production, Okay, uh, engineering department will communicate to their boss their issues regarding the machine. It's not functioning well. So the, they communicate with their supervisor, right? Or they need a new machine to run the production. They need uh, capital allocation for that. So they co coordinate with higher management. Okay, they train their, their employees, their staff as to how to use the machine. They deal with their engineering subordinates, okay? Uh, of course, they need to de deal with the clerical subordinates as well in the department, okay? And then they also communicate with the suppliers, okay? Our machine can, can produce more units than before, right? And it's, uh, it generates less pollution, less waste, etc. So these are the contacts outside the com company. Okay, so you know what? Uh, when you develop communication skills, it's not something that you do overnight, right? It's something that you acquire through time and through practice, right? So now you might be wondering why are you misunderstood? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, there are what you call personal barriers, right? So communication interferences that arise from human emotions, values, and poor listening habits, right? Uh, sometimes we multitask, right? While doing something, while speaking or listening, we multitask that you didn't actually absorb what that person is trying to say. So you have poor listening habits, right? Okay, so human emotions, uh, sometimes it's a cultural thing. Right? Uh, we Filipinos are not so combative, right? We don't like saying it up front or we don't like being too direct. Sometimes we sugarcoat our frustrations, right? It could be a cultural thing. So that is a personal barrier, right? But when you go and deal with other nationalities, okay, uh, they don't really mean to offend you, but they really say what they mean. They, so it's something that you have to take as at face value, right? So that is something that I have learned working with other nationalities when during my stint as an OFW. <laughs> they don't really mean to attack you. It's just that they're just trying to say what they really want to say. They, they say it like, as it is. <laughs> so they don't mean to offend you or anything. Okay, so there are what also what you call physical barriers so communication interferences that occur in the environment in which the communication takes place right okay so if you're attending mass you're expected to listen you're not expected to talk right same thing if the teacher is speaking in class okay so there are what you call physical barriers right uh another example elevator okay when you take the elevator, it's a place to keep quiet, right? You, you rarely encounter people who talk in an elevator. If that person talks or they laugh loudly in the elevator, it's, re it's quite odd. It's weird, right? They don't really consider the comfort of the people, uh, what do you call this, riding the elevator with you at the same time. So, 
uh, the elevator is one of the places where you should keep quiet. <laughs> so you have physical barriers, and then you also have semantic barriers arise with uh, from limitations in the symbols with which we communicate. Right? Uh, historically, uh, we were colonized by Spain, and then. Uh, 50 years under American rule, then three years under Japanese rule. So what do you call this? The Philippines is a hodgepodge of all these things, right? So we are basically, uh, uh, what do you call this? A convent with rock and roll, right? So a convent with a rock and roll because 50, 300 years of Spanish rule followed by 50 years of American rule, right? So we... We have influences of rock and roll and the uh, Roman Catholic Church, right? So uh, just like the Latin American countries, right? So you have semantic barriers, right? Okay, so it's the symbols that we use. Just imagine if the Romans never really promoted the Roman script, right? <laughs> what kind of letters are we going to use? Maybe we're going to use our own native, native uh, script, the Alibata. Right. Uh, if you will remember your world history, Thailand was never under any foreign influence. Okay, uh, that's why to this very day the Thais they kept their own script, their own script, the way they write, they have their own uh, way of writing, even their numbers. Okay, <laughs> that's why it's very difficult to, as a tourist, to survive on your own when you go to Thailand. Right. Okay. So there, you have semantic barriers because of the symbols, the symbols with which we communicate. Uh, one of the gutsiest thing I ever did was to travel to China alone. I don't speak Mandarin aside from Ni Hao, Xie Xie, right? Okay. So when I went there, I'm totally lost, right? But it's part of the learning experience as well. Okay. So you also have nonverbal communication. You know what? We Filipinos are so fond of this. Okay, uh, nonverbal communication, a communication transmitted through actions and words rather than through words. Okay, so for example, you have a classmate, that classmate of yours has new shoes. Okay, tapos, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, you're forced to, to uh, you know, give compliments to your classmate. Uy, ang ganda naman ng shoes mo, then matching roll eyes, diba? That's very Filipino, right? <laughs> <laughs> so your sincerity, okay, you are speaking words of sincerity, but your actions tell otherwise. So that's something also very uh, unique to us, right? So we don't know if, you know, if that is a foreigner, you could easily trick him or her, right? But to a fellow Filipino, since we are very much aware of our uh, facial reactions and our own culture, right? Uh, you cannot fool us. No, <laughs> it takes one to know one, right? So, <laughs> so you have mostly unconscious or subconscious represents a major portion of the messages sent and received. So, please take note of your facial expression, right? Okay, your voice. Hindi naman ako galit eh, diba? <laughs> Mannerisms, your posture, and the way you dress. Right, so most especially if you're trying to deliver a talk just like this, I have to wear long sleeves, right? So that's part of the nonverbal communication, right? So you dress up to the, the occasion, right? So facial expression, voice, mannerism, posture, and dress, right? Okay. But there are some uh, cultures that are not so expressive. Filipinos, we're very expressive when we're trying to deliver something, right? But, you know, there are some uh, cultures that that are not so expressive, okay? I think it's something that we inherit, and I think it's a good thing, right? Okay, so what are the sources of cues during face-to-face -face communication, right? So uh, you take a look at the verbal cues, which are actual words spoken, right? And then the vocal cues, like, hindi naman ako galit eh, pero mahal naman kita eh, pero gusto mo naman lang magpaghawalay. Right, so okay, so vocal cues include the pitch, the tone, and timber of a person's voice. Okay, and then also you have to be aware of your facial expressions, right? Okay, 
uh, it's quite difficult to talk to a psychologist because a psychologist may not be able, may not be fooled, right? Because the psychologist or psychiatrist can read your personality from the words that you use, your body actions, etc. Right. So those are the sources of cues during face-to-face -face communication. Okay. So uh, let's try to take a look at this particular slide. Okay. What are the weights of cues in verbal in in message interpretation? Okay. So according to a study, okay, the verbal impact is seven percent. The vocal impact is 38%. The facial impact is 55%. Okay, so I'm not mad. It's not what you say, but how you say it. You know what? One thing that I like with the online classes, as a teacher, uh, there is less pressure on us. We feel, we feel less judged. That's one thing that I like about online classes. When when you talk in a physical setting, there is our physical classes, the the eyes of our student, we can tell that we are being judged, most especially on the first day of class. The good thing about online classes is that we don't know if they are actually looking at us, right? Because nakapatay yung camera. So to me, it builds my self-confidence, right? <laughs> So that's one good thing that I realize with online classes. I like the impact of not of not establishing much eye contact. But you know, if you are a public speaker, you should establish eye contact. <laughs> but online classes, it is devoid of that one. Okay, so uh, now, so you have what you call communication networks, channels by which information flows, formal networks, okay, task-related communications that follow the authority chain. And the, the next slide, okay, this one's more interesting. Okay, you know what? Filipinos, they love gathering news, whether formal or informal, right? Okay, so you have what you call informal network or the communication grapevine. Okay, in the Philippines, this one is more known as chismis, right? Chismis, actually it's a form of communication right <laughs> so uh that's a cultural thing uh filipinos love chismis because you know what chismis there is a reason why they are born right there is a reason why they are passed on from one person to another as if it were a legend right okay so uh later on we will talk of chismis a little more okay so let me just finish this the informal communication so communication within an organization that is not officially sanctioned right okay sometimes sa opisina nauna pa yung mga staff malaman ko ano yung announcement right diba? so there is what you call informal communication merong buzz Iba kaya nga sa Pilipinas meron tayong show the buzz, right? Okay. So, bakit siya nagtinawag the buzz? Dahil kasi something is going on. There is a critical number of people talking about it, right? Okay. So, that is a form of informa uh, informal communication. So, it can circumvent rank of authority. Hindi kung ikaw yung boss, hindi mo pa na-announce, alam na nila. Diba? Naunahan ka. So, it circumvents rank of authority. So, can link organization members in any combination of directions. Dahil kasi ideally, sa office, from boss to staff. Ganon yung announcement. Pero kaminsan, alam na nila. Hindi, hindi mo pa na-announce. Kung baga, merong tweety bird. Kaya nga may Twitter. <laughs> That's why Twitter was named after that. You have the tweety bird, right? That The tweety bird will announce, right? That's the good, the beauty of Twitter. You keep your messages short and simple in several sentences na, na deliver mo yung impact ng message. Right? So, okay. Ito naman, mga informal channels of communication coexist with formal communications. They may skip hierarchical levels, cuts across vertical chains of command. Okay? Connects virtually anyone in the organization. Okay? Now, if you are a professional, uh, it is expected that you keep tabs of what's going on in your office, in your in your group or department. That's why, as managers, we call it MBWA. Okay, 
di ba in the morning you will see your boss uh, going from office to office talking to people okay it's not that they are spying on you or uh, keeping tabs on you okay it's more of checking on you because it's part of their job is to uh, monitor what's going on so you have what you call MBWA which is management by wandering around right so and of course the more informal one the cheese miss uh, grapevine <laughs> right Okay, so ito naman yung management by wandering around, uh, communication technique in which managers inter interact directly with workers to exchange information. And the grapevine, okay, uh, it is an informal person-to-person -person communication network of employees that is not officially sanctioned by the organization. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Uh, we're almost done. Okay. So types of grapevine chains. Okay. Uh, this is just a philosophical point that I take. Okay. Sometimes kasi chismis falls on you. Right. <laughs> so th what's the best way for you to stop the spread of the chismis? The, the best way for you to stop the spread of the chismis is for you to uh, not to spread it at all. Right. So you mga pass the message, you call that the single strand grapevine chain. Yung gossip, okay, gossiping, you have one person and th this person spreads it to everyone else. Yung probability, uh, you just choose the people you want to pass it to, right? But nevertheless, it's like a virus, it spreads, right? Uh, cluster, okay, you spread it to groups of people, right? To groups of people. So if a chismis, if you want to kill the chismis, don't spread it, right? So it's like putting on your mask, no? <laughs> and your face shield. Don't spread it at all. <laughs> so types of grapevine chains, union. Okay, so okay, so you have the network. Okay, last five minutes. Okay, a group of people who develop and maintain contact to exchange information informally. A network could be both internal and external, but usually built around external interests such as recreation, social clubs professional groups, career interest, and trade meetings. Of course, if you become a professional, you have your professional groups, right? Or professional organizations. Okay, so uh, these networks help you enrich your uh, social circle, right? Social circle. Okay. Okay, so the benefits of networking. Okay, when I say networking here, it's not that I'm selling something, okay? I'm not recruiting you, okay? So the networking here refers to the group of people you're connected with. So the benefits of networking broadens the interest of employees, keeps employees more informed about new technical developments, makes employees more visible to others, and results in productive working relationships. Okay, so but with the pandemic, we can only resort to virtual uh, networking for now. Okay, and that ends my presentation. So I hope you were able to uh, get some insights on networking, on communication, whether you are a student or a professional developing communication skills. It's not overnight. It's not overnight, but nevertheless, uh, it is important that we learn the communication essentials in order for us to become more competitive in our schools and in our workplace. So without, uh, with that, I end my talk. I greet everyone in Centro Escolar Las Piñas. A happy Foundation Day. So thank you so much. Thank you and have a good day. God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Halcon, for that comprehensive and engaging talk on how essential communication is, both for students and professionals. So may we ask you to remain on stage. This time, we will award you a certificate of appreciation. And may I call back on stage Dr. Abelia to present and award the certificate. Um, Centro Escolar Las Piñas presents this certificate of appreciation to our very own Dr. Frederick A. Halcon for having delivered the talk entitled Communication Essentials for Students and Professionals during this 
45th Foundation Day of CLP with the theme Escolarians Committed to Embrace Positive Changes in Times of Challenges. Given this 19th day of October 2020, assigned yours truly as AVP for Academic Affairs, uh, our Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Teresa R. Perez, and our President, Dr. Maria Cristina D. Padolina. Thank you so much, Dr. Halcon. Please accept this certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Abelia and Dr. Halcon. Okay, to our viewers, if you have any questions regarding the webinar, kindly type them in the chat box and then we will communicate or address them to our speakers. Again, if you have questions or clarifications regarding the webinars that were just held, kindly type them in the chat box so that we can address them to the speakers. Okay, I guess there are no questions anymore. At yes, if you have uh, follow-up questions, you may email us and then we will just answer you through or via email. And we are done with our webinars. Once again, we would like to thank our respected and distinguished speakers, Dr. Anastasio and Dr. Halcon, for sharing their time and knowledge with us. At this juncture, let me call on Dr. Teresa R. Perez, Vice President for Academic Affairs, to give her closing remarks. Dr. Maria Cristina Di Padalina, President of CELP, Dr. Leonila Abella, ABP for Academic Affairs and Dean of Studies, Mrs. Celia Lamarca, Registrar and OIC of Basic Ed Department, other school officials, Dr. Rose Bustamante, Dr. Eric Halcon, Ms. Iris Dumawal, faculty members, staff, students, and of course, our uh, speakers for this morning, Dr. Halcon and Dr. Flordelisa Anastasio. Good morning to all of you. Still morning. First, I would like to say big congratulations to this school for reaching 45, the 45th year milestone, five years as Centro Escolar Las Piñas. It was a great morning with all the activities that has been lined up for our students and faculty from the basic education to the college scholarians. I would like to extend my gratitude to the committee headed by Dr. Abelia, Mrs. Lamarca and the rest of the faculty and staff for making this remarkable program this morning, including the technical preparations for the program. After this program and listening to our speakers, we have some points for reflection. Today is a day of celebration, a day not only because of the number of years the school has served the community, but because of the significant number of graduates who are doing well in their respective fields, including our mass presider this morning, Father Albert. It means that the school has done well to benefit those it serves. Today is the date when the school first opened its doors to the young children of Las Piñas. CELP has its ups and downs, but it always is emerged as victorious. Now the scholarians are facing challenges again. The pandemic brought fast changes not only in school, but in our everyday life. Hence, today is the time to show our resilience, mentioned also by Dr. Anastasia in her talk. Today is the day to show our capability to recover quickly from difficulties. Today is the time to show our flexibility and adaptability to changes. That is why we have to be empowered. And the talk of Dr. Halcon on communication is a way of empowerment. Today is also a day of gratitude, a day of thanksgiving, so that we rightfully started today with a thanksgiving mass. Gratitude makes sense of our past, bring peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. This is a quote I got from Melody BT. So to further illustrate, indulge me to quote this song from one of my favorite films, 
the land before time. Don't lose your way with its passing day. You've come so far, don't throw it away. Leave believing, dreams are for weaving, wonders are waiting to start. Leave your story, faith, hope, and glory. Hold to the truth in your heart. If we hold on together, I know our dreams will never die. Dreams see us through to forever, as high as souls can fly. The clouds roll by for you and I. For me, this is a beautiful song that generally tells people of faith to hold on or stay strong for together. First, the song tells us not to lose our way or throw our faith away. Then, it tells us to be strong or hold on together. And then it talks about the light, the light of our Lord that is always with us. It says in the verse, in the dark, we'll feel the light, warm our hearts, everyone. Last but not the least, it tells us that our dreams will always see us through. In other words, nothing will ever be lost. And that includes our dreams even this and even this pandemic will not stop us. We will adapt to changes. And the song ends with a beautiful message that says our lives will not be dark and cloudy forever. The clouds will part or roll by as in the lyrics and our sky will be clear again. Such beautiful song filled with beautiful messages inspired by, I believe, the loving Almighty God. It never failed to move me, move me every time I hear it since I watched the movie because my heart always finds peace and comfort in those beautiful messages. It is very fitted to scholarians committed to embrace positive changes in times of challenges. Let us hold on together. We will continue as one family the dreams we are weaving for CELP. Let us keep the fire burning, and I pray that the rest of the beauty of our beautiful dreams come true. Congratulations again, CELP. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Perez. We are pleasured to hear those words from you. Once again, thank you so much. Before we formally event and the event, we would like to thank and acknowledge the following people for making this event possible. Dr. Maria Cristina Di Padolina, Dr. Teresa R. Perez, Dr. Leonila C. Abelia, our speakers Dr. Halcon and Dr. Anastasio, Dr. Rosemary Vic Bustamante, Mr. Vladimir Ocampo, Mrs. Celia Lamarca, our technical team Sir Marvin, Sir Gino, Sir Juby, Ma'am Jessica, and Ma'am Syra, I were our maintenance staff, of course, and our almighty God. Change has always been and will always be constant in our lives. But this time, it's a more difficult change to embrace. As we fight the battle against pandemic, may we, as scholarians, continue to spread hope, compassion, and love. This has been the 45th Foundation Day of Centro Escolar Las Piñas. My name is Ms. Rosel A. Balanga, your host for today. God bless and enjoy the rest of the day. Let us now sing the Centro Escolar hymn. Thank 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Perez. Okay, once again, we would like to thank everyone who attended the Foundation Day of Centro Escolar Las Piñas. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Po. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nila. Congrats. Na. Okay, na. Congratulations. Congratulations. Ma'am Nila. Congratulations, po, Ma'am Nila. Dr. Eric. Yes, thank you to all. Marvin. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Thank you.